Good morning. Good morning. What an honor it is for the Ephraim Historical Foundation to be included in the Hanseatic exhi exhibition celebrating the life and work of Karsten and Ellen Topelman. With true humility, I offer these words about two Ephraimites who said yes to the hero's journey. These expressive individuals, an ocean away from their German birthland, somehow found each other and together created a legacy of art. I've been charged with placing the Topelmans in the historical context of Door County, especially Ephraim, and also in the context of world events and social customs that influence their lives, which in turn shape their art. I'll share words attributed to Karsten and Ellen gleaned from newspaper articles and brochures, as well as stories I've heard about them. All in about 20 minutes. How can this be done? Well, of course it can't. And so today, I invite you to listen, reflect, and respond, not academically, but from the heart. For that is the kind of people they were. Together, we'll lift up the Topelmans as a compelling example of Door County's late 20th century artists. I'll call them the Resume One Group. These artists arrived in Door County around 1970. I'll mention quite a few names, not to be a name dropper, but to perhaps spark a memory for those who knew them and to light a fire of curiosity for those of you who didn't. We'll take questions, Cody and I, that is, after Cody speaks, and he will be following me, as you know, sharing some information and some thoughts about pieces from the Foundation's collection. I'm not going to focus on their painting style and techniques, but will share a handout, or have shared a handout, with 1970s articles describing their work. One is from the Resume One booklet, One's from the Resume One booklet. Oh gosh, now I gotta find my place again. Another was written in 1978 by Ephraimite Henry Shea. It's a real period piece with the phrase feminine side and links the Who Loves Your Baby TV detective Kojak to the Topolins. The last page of the handout features images quite different from what is exhibited here, and I will share some thoughts. As we talk about the Topolins, be aware of the values reflected in their life choices and in their art. Values like hospitality, resourcefulness, and living with joy. Joy, reportedly Ellen's favorite word. And pay attention to the things that sustain them, no matter their circumstances, because they just might be the same things that can sustain us today. Things like community, the sacred, and relationship. They poured themselves into their relationship with each other, someone told me. How wise. I am speaking in abstractions. It's time to paint concrete images. Let's start by imagining the landscape that drew the Tolkemans and other artists to Door County. Fifty-some years ago, Door County looked different. It was more pure then, remembered someone I spoke with, adding, it was a magical time. Less traffic, less crowded, said others. The peninsula was quite pastoral and peppered with farms, including Jay Christensen's strawberry fields at the top of Little Sister Hill, near today's Associated Bank. Teens drove past in gas guzzler cars with roaring V8 engines singing, strawberry fields forever. It's true, they really did. Rolling meadows, orchards, and pasture land with scattered woods and more birch, Karsten's favorite tree to paint. You see the forest that had grown up after Wisconsin's logging era was younger than today. See if you can spot birch trees in this exhibition, including several seen through a window in one of Ellen's paintings. Silvery low bluffs cut through the land and Lake Michigan's cerulean blue waters surrounded it all. Eye-popping stories were still on everyone's lips, tales like the one of old John Kadavko, who once farmed on Middle Road in Peninsula Park. Did you hear he disappeared in the evening swamp after playing cards at a local tavern? Condos, 
just on the horizon, National Geographic. Now that was something on everyone's lips. To read that Kingdom So Delicious article in the 1969 March issue, people asked, how's about that photo of Ephraim's two steepled skyline? Do you think that kind of publicity will bring more tourists? Spoken in a Door County dialect, sounding like Uper with a dash of Scandinavian, one I cannot easily imitate, a dialect that has almost disappeared. On June 16, 1969, Madeline Turtolo's column, Artists Around, appeared in the Door County Advocate. She was writing for the Peninsula School of Art, a venture she'd established in 1965. It had evolved from the Ephraim Art School she founded way back in 1943, located behind the Anderson Hotel on Highway Q. Turtolo wrote, Art attracts art, and there seems to be no saturation point as long as the tourist influx is on the increase. The range in painting is realism through the abstract, and the crafts from candles and hooked rugs through pottery, glass, jewelry, and weaving. It looks like a good season for the arts in general. She goes on to mention Dick Lauder's gallery near Fish Creek's Nordor Ski Hill, newly opened Edgewood Orchard Galleries, and Mildred Armato, who had set up shop in this Emma Tufts, former Bailey's Harbor home, renamed the Red Geranium. Millie Armato's portrait by Jim Ingerson hangs behind you in the upper gallery. A portrait of Phyllis Ingerson, Jim's wife, is on the opposite wall. The Ingersons and Topelmans became good friends in part through the long-running sketch sessions at the Ingersons barn. The Ingersons, Topelmans, and folks like Chicken Sue Peterson were the older cohort of the wave of artists circa 1970 who sought a different, more creative lifestyle. But back to the paintings overhead, from ponchos to an oversized southwestern Silver style belt buckle, these period portraits scream 1970s fashion. Our model wears jeans, which is remarkable when one considers that at the same time Gibraltar teacher Eunice Rutherford was doggedly petitioning the school board to be allowed to wear a pantsuit. Enter <laughs> the Topolmans. They vacationed in North. East Wisconsin, shortly after immigrating from Germany, separately before they met. Karsten immigrated from Munich in the south, Ellen from Hamburg in the north. Hundreds of thousands of Germans came to the U.S. in the early 50s. The 10-year Allied occupation of West Germany, where Karsten and Ellen lived, ended in 1954. As cumbersome as it might have been arranging sponsors, Imagine the bureaucracy they would have faced if they lived in Russian-occupied East Germany. The Door Peninsula impressed them both. For Karsten, the endless possibilities of plain air painting were especially captivating. After meeting in Chicago, marrying, and having children, the Topolmans began to vacation here as a family. Later, Ellen reflected on painting and sketching during their weeks-long summer trips. We were overwhelmed by the beauty, she said. We had to become year-round residents. By 1971, they owned 80 acres near Jacksonport. On Sunday drives in their beater car, Ellen would say in a thick German accent, Bach in heaven. When the Topamans purchased a ramshackle Ephraim house with outdated cottages, they began living their dream of being full-time artists. The Hanseatic Gallery opened in 1972. According to son Lars, mom was determined and strong. She worked the business. Dad was not so sure it would really work. It was a daring move. At the time, friends and relatives thought the Topolmans foolhardy. Karsten was employed as art director for a Chicago corporation, a position he held for 17 years. He was in his early 40s. 
peak earning years with three children under the age of 12. If that were not cause for concern, the Ephraim house initially had no electricity, no running water, and no insulation. Did Karsten, a 20th century man, simply dismiss society's expectations of him as the family's primary financial provider? No. Resourcefulness was something both he and Ellen had to master as children. Remember, they grew up in Nazi Germany, where scrounging for lumps of coal falling from trains could mean the difference between surviving winter cold or freezing to death. Soon after opening the gallery, Carson secured paid work designing Door County tourism publications. He monetized graphic design skills that had supplemented his classical training while a student at a prestigious Munich Academy. Typography was a strength. Just look at the balance and control in his signature. By the way, be sure to notice Ellen's signature too. One of its letters, the O with the slash, is a giveaway that she has Scandinavian blood. It's an alphabet letter used by the Danes and Norwegians. Her great, 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 could be another great grandfather, was a lighthouse keeper on Denmark's, here we go, got to see if I can pronounce this right, Sprago Island. Kind of? Kind yeah, of. Same, same, same. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's move on. We got you. Karsten has had been lucky enough to have Fritz Emke as a professor. Several of Emke's typesets are still used today. Karsten's architect father was another important influence. Karsten, it seems to me, also had an intuitive understanding of branding. Despite being described by one longtime friend as more of a dreamer, he could meet deadlines, critical and graphic design contracts. Did Ellen occasionally prod him? I wonder. Fearball medallions created pro bono decades later also reveal this man's eye for graphic design. Ellen, Kate, Anna, Sprogo brought her own brand of optimistic resourcefulness and German discipline. I was told, for example, she cranked, cranked out small, affordable floral paintings that sold well. As for her time-consuming acrylic work, Lars and Lisa recalled their Buddha painting late into the night after completing a myriad of tasks. It seems societal expectations impacted Ellen's life as an artist, too. Undoubtedly, roles evolved and the freedom to paint increased as the children grew and the gallery turned a profit. But in the early years, Ellen was keen on making sure her husband had time to paint. Karsten, classically trained, visited places at different times to photograph the light and take notes in his journal. Both Topelmans staffed the gallery. In time, they would hold court with visitors. Ellen was especially curious about how couples met, and Karsten loved to talk about his art. When the Hanseatic first opened, when the Hanseatic first opened, customers heard the thump, thump, thumping of footsteps in the rooms above as the children played. I wonder if sometimes they were sent outside as we all were back then, to bike or play with friends, to run wild, as Lars and Lisa described it recently. Ellen's resourcefulness extended to meals. A friend remembered a freezer stocked, and I mean stacked, with fish. She said jokingly, where did it all come from? Was she picking up fish that had washed ashore? <laughs> Ellen got day-old bread from Wilson's to make bread pudding and gave leftover crumbs to outdoor stray cats. In February, the family tapped trees for maple syrup. They gathered morels and chanterelles from the woods. Ellen was also known for her onion and potato dark bread with a handful of coffee grounds added to sharpen the flavor. Nothing, nothing was wasted. 
If someone in the family raised an eyebrow, she said, I lived through the war. Our house always had an open door, remember daughter Lisa. Lunch parties with soup and homemade rolls happened especially around Oktoberfest. Guests included watercolor teacher Frances Vale and artist Andy Redman. Did vinyl records spin and later CDs play in the background? If so, friends heard music by classical composers Dvorak and Wagner. It was not jazz. Ellen told Karsten early on that she was not a jazz fan. In later years, the Topelman served tea in exquisite cups, Lamanazov porcelain, I think the tulip design, and cobalt. See if I'm right by finding the teacup in an exhibition painting here. These were from St. Petersburg, Russia, which they knew what, which they knew as Leningrad until the 1989 fall of the Berlin Wall. By this time, a good black tea was easy to find in Door County. How different from the 70s, when local tea and coffee choices were so very, very limited. The Topelmans were not alone in hosting and attending galleries, especially potlucks. In those days, the season ended right after Labor Day. Restaurants, hotels, and summer theater closed up. Many artists, especially the younger crowd, had little money surviving on tips from waitressing or carpentry jobs, lively conversations over simple potluck dinners, hospitality, nurtured, treasured friendships. Monthly lunch meetings of German immigrant women living in Door County was another way Ellen sought out a feeling of community. While there, they only spoke German. They, they were not the first Germans to make Door County their home. Germans arrived in Ephraim soon after the founding of the village. In 1853, many farmed the area called the German settlement. In the early 1900s, Welker's Casino, a health spa of sorts owned by a German physician and his wife from Milwaukee, attracted a German clientele. During the World Wars, there was anti-German sentiment. Sturgeon Bay High School band teaching German for a short time. And Ephraim summer resident, Chicago Symphony Orchestra conductor Frederick Stock resigned for a year following a public outcry. I don't think the Topelmans experienced much of this, but their strong accents apparently sounded odd to a few of their children's friends. What a contrast to Ephraim's early years, when the Moravian pastor often preached in multiple languages so everyone in the village could understand. Ellen was known to proclaim, Ephraim is the pearl of the peninsula, and with tenderness, our village. What? was Ephraim like in 1972 when the Topelmans opened the gallery? There were two gas stations, a Sinclair on the south side and a Texaco closer to the village hall. Proprietors sold Coca-Cola small glass bottles and candy bars. One Door County native told me he was in high school then and saw grown-ups, including women, exchange money for a brown paper bag filled with Hooch. Yes, in dry Ephraim. There were more teens in 20-somethings. The baby boomers were coming of age, men with long sideburns and bushy mustaches, a few wearing surplus army, olive, surplus olive green army shirts cut off at the shoulders. One or two local boys had just returned from Vietnam. And young women walked around in long dresses from Nepal, unless they were rushing to the yacht club. Then they wore nautical shorts and crop tops, walking fast in dark brown topsiders. Many were in uniform and hustled to Wilson's or to a local hotel. The Topolmans were soon seen walking to the beach each morning, wearing bathrobes. They had 
no running water after all. They continued the European custom of waking to a bracing swim for years and were once flagged down by a police officer responding to a call to help two old people drowning in the bay. <laughs> they weren't drowning. They were just swimming enthusiastically. From the beginning, they also strolled eat from shore at sunset, sometimes gathering driftwood to make into picture frames. Did Ellen wear her zebra dress on these strolls? Or did she don another signature look? Blue jeans, a smock, and wooden clogs. A round collared blouse with tiny Edelweiss flowers. A doe skin jacket from Bunda's Hutch with her long braids accented by a geometric headband. As for Karsten, Ellen made sure the bright hues of his vest and patterned button-down shirt complemented her get-up. Never a t-shirt and never a baseball cap, though brimmed hats were allowed. In 1972, did the Tobelman see Doris, artist Doris Heisey Miller through the glass window of her shop, Cabin Craft, which was located on the shore, arranging dance square or pounding out Art Deco style jewelry. It was Heisey's last summer. Doris was a part of an earlier wave of artists the generation that came between the world wars. She opened Cabin Craft during the Great Depression in 1933. That decade, the 1930s, saw the establishment of the Clearing, Peninsula Arts Association, the Ridges Sanctuary, Peninsula Players, a creative and institutional explosion in a backdrop of rampant poverty with war brewing in Europe, in Hitler's Germany. How different the sights and sounds must have been compared to Ephraim. Knowing the historical context of their childhoods gives insight into Ellen's words from the 1982 Hanseatic brochure. I paint what makes me happy. My happy little people remind me of my childhood in Germany before the war. She wanted to find a way to capture something people hungered for. A decade earlier, Karsten is quoted in the Door County Advocate, through my paintings, I communicate a sense of mood, atmosphere, and attitude toward life. Peaceful appeal, you might say. Something more lasting than momentary visual excitement. He spoke of the challenge of change and the never-ending creativity that Door County offered. The Tobelmans were able to do what mythologist Joseph Campbell counseled, find a place where there's joy, and the joy will burn out the pain. Art can be therapeutic and healing. Examples of two such paintings are in your handout. The first is Ellen's Madonna-like work. The second is Karsten's, known informally as the Shushing Jesus. It hangs in the Ephraim Arabian Church and has been seen by hundreds of people over the past few decades. Many, including me, have funny stories about this painting. But I want to share words that Mr. Topelman said to the pastor about this work. He painted it after the loss of their beloved daughter, Tanya, who died at age 22. The pastor asked Karsten, what do you want people to take away from this painting of Jesus? He answered, be still and know that I am God. Be still. Calming oneself. Breathing 
Finding a safe, sacred space is sometimes all one can do when the world has fallen apart. Let's close by looking at the joyful painting on your right. St. Martin's Festival in Rotenburg, where the Topelmans had an apartment. Rotenburg was spared the violence of firebombing during World War II. Its medieval charm survived. In the painting, an exuberant crowd celebrates. They carry colorful lanterns as dusk settles over the city. The scene is nostalgic and playful. It's easy to see how Ellen's work in TV animation in Chicago influenced her style. Each little person is special, their clothing adorned with unique details. Ellen was keenly interested in clothing and as a young woman created remarkable pen and ink fashion drawings. Despite their distinctive styles, the Topolmans occasionally collaborated. Ellen drew the people and Karsten the buildings. They surprised each other by adding embellishments. One time, Karsten drew the word love on the ice of a painting by his wife. This painting is a collaboration. What a coincidence that the Feast of St. Martin is tomorrow, November 11th. One story about St. Martin, a fourth century bishop, for me has an echo in a story I heard about Karsten. St. Martin's father was an officer in the Roman cavalry, so he was expected to join as well. A pacifist, Martin said if he had to go to battle, he would do so without a weapon. The emperor, infuriated, thought him a coward and ordered him to battle the next day unarmed. Martin prepared to obey the order. Within our hours, the opposing army suddenly surrendered and Martin's life was spared. In 1945, as the Third Reich fell to its knees, Karsten reached the age of majority. He would be conscripted. Years later, he told a friend, I felt sure this was going to be my destiny. Remarkably, it wasn't. Within a day or two, Germany surrendered. Aren't we lucky that Karsten's destiny, and Ellen's too, turned out so differently? Thank you to those people who shared stories so that I could share them with you today. Thank you for your kind attention. And now I think there's a break. Is yeah, like a five minute break. Very short. And then we're going to hear from um, Foundation Director Cody Schreck. As Marie said, I'm Cody Schreck. I am the Executive Director of the Historical Foundation. Um, and I'm here to kind of build off some of those fantastic stories that Kathleen uh, shared with all of us. Um, and kind of give some context of some of the pieces by the Topolmans in our collection and why we feel they're important to the collection and why we preserve them. And then just briefly for those who are not familiar, I know I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, but the Ephraim Historical Foundation itself was founded back in 1949 as a nonprofit historic preservation organization. Uh, we have the mission of preserving, sustaining, and sharing the history and beauty of Ephraim, Wisconsin. Um, and as a part of our mission, uh, we do preserve historic buildings. That's one of the many things we do. It's probably one of the more public-facing things we do. But we also do much more than that as well. Uh, we do focus heavily on things like multi-generational education, exhibitions, tours, and a robust slate of programming as well. Um, in all, we're, just, we're a public-facing institution that really tries to engage with the community and make history accessible and fun for people. Uh, and as, as a part of our mission, we also steward a very large collection of artifacts and documents. Um, so we have thousands of photographs, 
um, paper documents, everything like that. Um, included in that is an art collection, a pretty sizable art collection. Uh, so I actually did the, the math uh, about two days ago before I came here, and we're at about 730 plus pieces of art in our collection, uh, which is pretty sizable for an organization of our size. And of course, within that large art collection are pieces uh, by Karsten and Ellen. Uh, so I brought a few here today. I have two on the table here to share, um, but I wanted to speak about a few in our collection and kind of share them with you. So. The first one we're going to look at is some that you might be familiar with, or one you might be familiar with. Um, it's a winter greeting card uh, that features a piece done by Ellen. Um, so this was actually donated to our organization um, by one of our longtime uh, volunteers and members. Um, she was an artist herself. Her name was Martha Hackmeister Cherry. Um, she lived in Ephraim for a long time. She was German as well. Um, but she also, when she died, actually gave us a large collection of her own personal art and her own art collection. And within the folders of art was this card. Um, it's a greeting card. She must have received it from a friend or had maybe sent it to a friend and got it back or something like that. But what she had done is she actually, you can see on the top, she actually tore off the actual message and just kept the art itself, which is interesting. Um, so I think that really speaks to how well-respected and loved uh, the Tobelman's art was in Ephraim, especially by locals. You know, um, We had a person here living in Ephraim for a lot of her life who, who thought it was important to not only keep this, but also donate it with her own art as well. Um, and I think it's it's interesting, you know, the piece itself, it it, it evokes a really, you know, comfy mood. Um, it's interesting. She just, we'll I'll talk about this a lot with this balance of steeples, especially in Karsten's work as well, uh, but including both the steeples as kind of the setting, and Ellen's doing a fantastic job of creating that kind of idyllic winter mood with Ephraim as a setting. Uh, and you have these kind of, these people kind of enjoying their evening with their with a Christmas tree and the dog, um, and this kind of light and smoke emanating from the churches. It brings that, that feeling of comfiness and togetherness of community on like the cold winter night. So I thought this was a very interesting one for you all to see, um, and we can jump ahead to the next one too. This one should look familiar. It's actually sitting right on the wall over there. Um, this is a very uh, well-known painting uh, by Ellen uh, Wilson's. This is one of the pieces that we loaned uh, to this exhibition. We've loaned several others as well. Uh, but this one was actually purchased by um, an individual in Ephraim and then actually from the gallery, purchased directly from the gallery and then donated directly to us. Um, and it captures, of course, you know, the quintessential Ephraim establishment in Wilson's and puts it in the context of a joyous community, which based on you know, the stories that Kathleen shared with us is very much you know, in tune with the, the themes and the inspirations for, for Ellen. Um, I love this piece because it forces perspective that's not really there, if you've ever been in this spot. Um, it, it kind of forces this, this plaza of people in front of Ephraim, or in front of Wilson's. Um, and also, you see what's Cherry Street, essentially, is that long street going all the way up the hill, which historically actually did. It used to go all the way up the hill, now there's a staircase stopping it. Um, but she's also you forced to include you know, Bethany Church in the background and the Anderson Hotel in the background. Um, which I think is, is fantastic. And you heard uh, Kathleen share a story about Wilson's. Um, and, I mean, it's, it's interesting that Wilson's was so, interest, or, um, so important to the, the Topelmans early on. Um, you know, there was once, the bread story, there was once a small grocery section in Wilson's uh, where, you know, Ellen would go in and buy the inexpensive bread and transform it into, uh, you know, bread pudding for the family. So Wilson, Wilson served an important function for the family early on. Um, but there's also a very interesting story, which I'm not sure has been shared yet before. It, I, it's a somewhat common story, not so common, um, in that it's actually about the piece itself. Uh, someone came in to buy this piece of Wilson's. It wasn't necessarily for sale, but Ellen said, you know, the actual Wilson's is for sale, not this painting. Um, so those individuals actually walked over and ended up purchasing the actual Wilson's. Um, so it's not even the painting, they got the building itself. Um, and it's interesting because this painting may have been the inspiration for the red and white awnings that are on the building now. Um, when, the, when the individuals bought the building, there actually was not red and white awnings. Ellen had put that on there. Um, so whether or not that had been there historically at some point, and Ellen was inspired by that, or she, I know in the uh, talk that uh, Lars and Lisa did, they talked about, you know, that the Hanseatic lead, the red and white colors, and you see the banners. I don't know if there's, excuse me, any sort of inspiration by that. Either way, this could have been inspiration for the red and white awnings. Um, so again, it just speaks to you know, the importance of, of Ellen's work um, and you know, capturing this kind of classic historical scene. This one's a little different. Um, this one's not a piece necessarily, it's a book. 
Uh, we have this book in our collection. We keep it in our non-lending library. It was published in 1999 to commemorate the 50th anniversary of our organization. So it's titled Half a Century with the Ephraim Foundation. Um, and it's pretty plain to see uh, the piece they chose was Our Village by Ellen Tuttleman, which is right there in the back. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's telling that, you know, the individuals as they put this book together, there's a lot of art that depicts Ephraim over the years um, by a lot, you know, a myriad of artists. This is the one they chose to represent uh, the anniversary of a historic preservation organization for its 50 years. So it really, it speaks to the fact that, you know, Ellen's work was very well respected in the community and she had a, a keen ability to capture kind of the joyous, historically focused community of Ephraim. Um, yeah. This one might be one of my favorites in the collection. Uh, this is a watercolor by Carson. Um, it measures about 34 by 28 framed. Um, there were, I believe, um, prints made from a variation of this work that you may have seen before. Um, the, it came into our collection um, because one of our longtime contributors, his name is Paul Burton, he's still around, um, he actually purchased this from the gallery and then donated it to us. And what's interesting in talking with Lars and Lisa, I didn't know this, I unfortunately never met Paul, um, but this is essentially you know, a forced perspective view of where the Burton property is. Um, so he whether, you know, probably saw this and felt it was a, a beautiful view and of course captures a lot of historiosity in it. Um, but again, much like the Wilson's piece, stretches perspective to put a lot of things in conversation, which I think is awesome. You have your classic downtown Ephraim with the bluff and the tower and Horseshoe Island and Nicolay Bay Beach and the Strawberry Islands and Chambers Island all forced into one perspective, which you're not going to see um, in real life, which is, I think, incredible. Um, but it also, I think, is a great piece that's indicative of Karsten Stiles throughout some of his other paintings, too. You have um, nature, serenity, the, the capturing of kind of a calm Ephraim mood on a, on a fall day, um, and also the balance again. You know, those two steeples down there that kind of are the, the anchor point for this perspective, those two steeples that kind of anchor you in place. We'll jump down to the next one. This is a unique one. This is one I brought with me. So afterwards, if after questions you have time, you want to come take a look. We have this piece here. Um, some of you probably recognize this because you were probably there when it was given out. Um, this is the 2012 Fear Ball Medallion. So show of hands, who doesn't know what Fear Ball is? Because I see a lot of individuals here who have been there. I think I see a chief in here as well. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Fear Ball is uh, the, pretty much the premier annual festival in Ephraim. Uh, it takes place in June. It's uh, kind of a celebration. That, I mean, they say it's the burning of the winter witch to celebrate the coming of summer. Um, so a big bonfire is erected and a community member is selected as chieftain and they're brought in kind of secretly on a boat and they start this fire to kind of kick off the event. Uh, Karsten himself served as chieftain in 2003. Uh, in 2012, he was selected to create the medallion for Nancy Davis, who was the, the, the chieftain that year. So this is, you know, a unique piece done by Karsten. It, it's three-dimensional. Um, in talking with Lars, uh, uh, we think, you know, someone helped him cut the wood. Uh, but other than that, you know, he, he did, you know, paint this kind of little bonfire here with the red um, Fear ball medallion or fear ball symbol, and then it's kind of gold leafed, which is a cool example of Karsten's ability to use gold leafing. And you know, being selected to be the chieftain, of course, is an honor, but also to be the artist to create the medallion is an honor in itself. So it speaks really to Karsten's uh, respect in the community as an artist and also as a community member. This one I was going to talk about, it's another book, but we'll skip ahead to this one. I brought a copy, it's a work of Karsten that's on there, but we'll jump ahead to this one. So this is another kind of unique work by Karsten, not something you're going to see in this exhibit necessarily, but an example of his graphic design work. So in 2003, uh, Karsten was tasked with creating the logo for Ephraim's sesquicentennial, that was messed that word up, the 150th anniversary of Ephraim. So this piece is here too, you can come take a look. Um, it's hand drawn, it's got white out on it, it's got his Carson's handwriting on it, it's kind of behind a film here. Um, used to create the logo for Ephraim's 150th, and then a bunch of stickers and merchandise are made from this. You'll probably still see this logo around town sometimes. Um, but, you know, because Karsten had professional training in graphic design, he was tasked with kind of doing this. Um, and it's a unique piece in our collection, because generally what we have from the Topelmans is their classic works, and this is a graphic design piece, which I think is fantastic. If you jump ahead to the next one. And as we're talking about logos, I thought it would be kind of 
and necessary and interesting to talk about the fact that not many people know that our logo, the one you see there on my shirt and other places, was designed by Karsten. So the Ephraim Historical Foundation logo was designed by Karsten Topelman in collaboration with some others. Um, so that story actually starts much earlier than this concept in 2016. Um, this actually starts this kind of relationship building that brought us to him creating our logo started back when Carson actually first arrived in the States back in the 1950s. Um, one of our previous presidents at the time, back in the 1950s, he was a young kid, going to Northwestern University, his name is Dick Volkman, he was going to Northwestern University, his father was a first generation German immigrant living in Chicago. Um, his father invited him to a kind of German social club, social club gathering. And at that social club gathering was Karsten. Karsten had just arrived recently in Chicago. He had been invited to this group, and Dick and Karsten were around the same age and kind of hit it off and became friends. Um, they talked for a while. They had kind of gone their separate ways over the years until about the 1970s um, when Dick Volkman was at his family's home in Ephraim and happened to be in town and see that Karsten was opening a gallery downtown. Um, so again, they uh, sparked up that friendship again and became very close. Uh, Dick, you know, bought pieces from the gallery all the time. Um, Dick and his wife vi visited Karsten and Alan while they were in Rotenburg, um, kind of just knocked on their door. Uh, but in 2016, uh, Dick approached Karsten and said, you know, I really love what you did with the 2003 logo. Can we do something like that for the Ephraim Historical Foundation? Our previous logo had been a, a picture of the room image of the bluff with kind of the sun, sun setting, which was beautiful, but Dick felt, you know, like we're a historic preservation, let's include the historic buildings. And of course, Karsten himself loved the architecture, the two steeples, so they went to work on that. And this was the first logo concept that they came up with. And you can see, you know, there's a lot of historic buildings in Diener. There's two buildings that stand out because they stretch beyond the borders. It's the two steeples, um, the, the two buildings that really anchor <coughs> to the place. And then if we jump ahead here to the next one, that brings us to our current logo. So they used that, uh, that first logo concept as an adaptation for this next one. Um, and what was happening is they were kind of going through meetings. I, Dick said they had about a dozen meetings about the logo. Uh, they were looking at fonts, how you lay out the buildings. And then one of the meetings, uh, Karsten was looking at the, the fonts and the logo and everything. He said, what if we drop Ephraim so the P and the I touch the, the top of the steeples? And everyone looked at it, and they said, that's it. Let's do that. Um, that. That was the end of that. That became our logo. We still utilize that logo today. Um, people often comment on, you know, it's interesting that the, the, two, the two churches touch the letters. It's kind of, it works together. But I think this, this logo story, it speaks to the many, you know, incredible impacts that Carson and Allen had on the community and the people of Ephraim, of course, on our organization. Um, there are many other pieces in the collection by the Topelmans, but I felt you know these were unique pieces that I would want to share with you. And then um, if you have any questions for Kathleen or I now, I think now would probably be the time. So thank you very much for you know participating. Thank you.